So, uh, being an academic, I will stand behind the, uh, this construction here. Otherwise, I feel I'm not speaking seriously. But um, I am very pleased and honored to talk to a group of such uh, combat veterans in the uh, struggle to make the life of workers better and the life of consumers better. Um, and I think uh, there are many similarities between what uh, I hear here and what I know you are doing now and the kind of work that I have been doing uh, because I am also interested in making life better in various ways. And um, the kind of similarities that uh, we have, um, I wanted to point out to some of them, but uh, I don't get cooperation from the technology here. Let's see. Well, why doesn't this move anything? Okay, all right. So, uh, to uh, the left is uh, a, a statement that tries to uh, describe what I call flow. And to the right is um, more uh, familiar uh, way of describing flow. And we heard just uh, two or three presentations before um, descri description of flow as a a management process, and um, the one to the left that my my uh, interest in flow is to make it possible for people not only to produce flow or to participate in flow, but to actually live in flow, to experience um, life as a um, uh, a series of experiences which um, go spontaneously from one to the other in a pattern that uh, makes life uh, better, uh, that makes it uh, uh, makes you want to continue to do what you're doing and that if you can do it in most parts of your life will uh, result in a state of well-being uh, ha and possibly happiness, or, or as close to ha happiness as humans can get. And, um, well, okay. This is a, a highly condensed um, uh, model of how happiness is uh, or how flow is produced and essentially uh, our research that has uh, been going on for over 50 years in this field and it's, is um, uh, the best way to, to describe flow is in terms of these two uh, variables. Uh, the vertical one is the amount of challenge that you face and the horizontal one is the skill that you have in, in situations that, of challenge, of the kind of challenge that you are facing. And as you see that uh, we can measure quite um, precisely people's skills and their perception of challenge. We use uh, electronic pages that people wear and report uh, moment by moment if they are signaled, they say how much challenge they perceive and how many skills they think they have. And when both are high, that's the condition of flow up there. Um, if it's above the mean for you, the week that you are being studying, then it's almost certain that in that moment when you are above average challenge, above average skill, that's when you report the best, you feel most concentrated, more strong, more uh, happy. The other combinations of challenge and skill get uh, less and less um, positive. 
For instance, the two to the side of flow, arousal, where you, your skill is a little below what is really needed, but you feel that you are close enough to being able to, to face the challenge. That's arousal, and that's a very positive state also. And below flow, you know, the state of control, is one where uh, the challenge is, is not really very exciting because you have done this before and you feel quite in control. Uh, you think you can cope with the skills that you have. And that's also positive. Um, and um, uh, relaxation is even less challenged, but it's still positive. But then you get in the area of boredom where um, you feel that you're not using any of your skills and the challenges are low. And that's, um, that's not a very good situation. And usually the worst uh, is the bottom left corner apathy where you have no challenge and no, no, you are not using any skills. And then as you move up, you enter the state of worry and then anxiety, um, which is also a very uh, negative state for most people. So it is um, this, this uh, way of conceiving of the state of mind based on simply the level of challenge and the level of skills is a fairly good predictor or descriptor of how people actually feel during the day, during the week, or during life. And um, um, usually, before you get into flow, there are certain preconditions, there are certain uh, environmental um, situations that uh, need to be present. One is that it's hard to get into flow unless you know what you want to accomplish or, or what the goal is, what the challenge is. And so that is um, uh, one of the usual prerequisites of flow. And then uh, um, certain challenges are, are just uh, negative and you don't want to even consider them, but mostly um, uh, the challenge should be one that you have uh, successfully tried to accomplish before and you had certain success with it. So the challenge is, um, is seen as, as uh, positive and that it balances with your skill level. And then the other uh, outside condition that is usually important is that you can see whether you are succeeding or failing. So there is a continuous feedback. It's hard to persist in an activity where you have to, to uh, do something without knowing whether what you're doing makes sense or not, whether it's successful or not. And so that um, uh, the, um, being able to present feedback is important for uh, flow to occur. Now, this is, uh, uh, again, um, simplified uh, um, schema or, or, uh, of how flow um, works out during um, a normal uh, process. For instance, suppose that you are starting some new project or uh, a new uh, uh, skill of some sort where your skills are still low um, you, you don't get into flow unless the challenges are low too. Okay, so the A on that level, the left, uh, lower left hand is the starting point. Now, if you practice that activity for a while, it, your skills increase. But if the challenge remains the same, you soon end up being bored because you say, okay, now I can do that. Why am I still doing it, okay? And uh, either you quit after B, or you, you have to increase the challenges, and then you are in C and you feel back in flow. Now, 
Um, that would be a good place to stay, but you are either going to go again into boredom or the challenges suddenly become too high because, because you are good at it, at sea. Uh, your boss gives you a, a, an assignment that really stumps you, that you are not prepared to handle. Then you end up in D, being too hard and so forth. And if you are lucky, um, you survive in D and you develop more skills, you end up in E where you are back into flow. And any kind of activity that we do, whether it's playing the violin or uh, playing chess or uh, learning to do um, an engineering job or whatever, it's a constant um, fluctuation between too much challenge or too little challenge. And to, to keep people in flow, that is, keep them feeling that this is good, this is exciting, this is interesting, you have to be able to uh, make uh, it possible for the person to uh, balance the amount of challenge with the skills they have, either by increasing challenge or increasing skills. Um, so that's, um, uh, for instance, one one uh, profession that I studied uh, quite intense for a, quite a bit, uh, period of time is surgery because it turned out that surgeons are really uh, mostly so devoted to, to their work um, because not just because they help people, because they save life, because they make a lot of money, all of which is true, but also because the experience itself is so um, and, and exciting and involving that they will do it even when, um, uh, for instance, I, some of these surgeons that I studied at first and got me interested in this problem were people who say that the surgeons say that um, you know you know I and I haven't taken any vacation the first five years since I started surgery. Then my wife said, "No, this can't go on. Let's go and spend some weeks in uh, uh, Acapulco, in Mexico," and took me there. And I stayed in the um, seashore on the beach for three or four days, and then I felt so bored that I uh, volunteered to do operation surgery in the hospital. And that I did surgery in the morning, and I went to the beach in the afternoon, and I was happy. So that um, uh, when they describe surgery, they describe these conditions. And these are, uh, these are the same that you find uh, basketball players describe when they play, or chess players, or uh, anybody who likes what they're doing, they describe it as the concentration becomes so uh, into the activity that uh, all kinds of distractions uh, disappear. Um, you have surgeons who uh, one surgeon, at least, um, I talked to who just came out of operation and said, you know what happened? And uh, said, I was, after I finished the operation, the nurse came there and, and went like this to me. And I said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm getting the plaster off your, uh, off your uh, smock because, says, why? And, said, and she said, well, uh, you know, the ceiling fell to pieces and while you were operating and and the person the surgeon didn't notice it you know and it was so it was so into the operation that the fact that the ceiling was kind of disintegrating and falling uh, was uh, didn't uh, bother him anyway um, you don't think about what will happen later or what happens before you just have to 
focus all on what's going on now because that's what matters. If you start thinking about, oh, will I do a good operation? Will this succeed or not? Your, your scalpel will, will move and, uh, will, in a wrong way and, and you will cu cut an artery or something. Or, um, and the sense of time is usually means that you, you may be doing something for a couple of hours and at the end you, you look at the watch and say, what happened? I, I thought it, it was only five minutes that ago that I started. And this is very typical. The, uh, on the other hand, there are um, ice skaters who s describe their triple lotses that um, take only uh, 20 seconds to do on the ice. And they say they experience it as if it half an hour because every little part of, of the experience uh, registers and it looks like uh, uh, all kinds of time, <laughs> but it's, it's just a second. So that time is not, the watch time no longer predicts how you feel, you know, because you feel, uh, your feeling of time depends on what you're doing and how you're paying attention and what you're looking for. And you forget about your problems. You don't for, you forget the uh, the things that happened at home or the your professional problems. Um, you you are just have to do the best that you can, and that's all you are focusing on. So um, now, obviously, in uh, the translation of this experience into business, is that. Um, if you have people at work who have flow when they are working, you find that the organization is, is moving quickly and uh, effortlessly. And the people who are working feel that what they are doing is enjoyable and makes sense to them and want to do it again. So it's... Um, you are almost guaranteed that the performance goes up if the pe more and more people in the, who are working there experience flow. And um, um, also, of course, you are a company that becomes known as a place where you can experience flow at work will become a magnet for people who want to do a job which is not only pays money, but also provides uh, addition to their well-being as uh, in life. And um, in many places when they start introducing flow, one of the first signs that it st starts to work is that the turnover goes down and you don't have to spend a lot of money and to keep up with the new employees who have to be trained and, and, and taught. And um, um, so this is um, how flow feels. And uh, um, the question is then, of course, you know, what can we do as employers, managers to make this happen? And um, the, um, the model of what makes flow happen helps to develop strategies for, like, first of all, you have to, to make sure that people know what they're doing and what they should be doing and that it's clear what the, a good job and a good performance that you expect is like. And you don't want to overwhelm them or bore them, uh, produce anxiety or boredom, which are the two areas w around when the challenges and skills are out of sync. Uh, feedback is important. Obviously, what you want is the employee, employee or the person himself to know 
what is good and bad so that you can give feedback to yourself. An expert is simply a person who knows how to, what's good and bad, what, what, what is, can read the feedback of their actions. That's an expert. And you want your workers to know that uh, what is good work, what's bad work. Um, and of course, uh, one thing that very often interferes with flow is the breaking up of a person's engagement with the work by having too many things interrupting and distracting. And that's, that's often one of the things that makes it hard for a worker to keep attention. In my work, I was also interested in, in looking at people who had made a big difference in, the, in their area of work and who seemed to uh, have um, a kind of a joy in what they were doing. And these are some of the people we interviewed um, whom I don't have to introduce to you, but um, certainly um, uh, all of these people had a very clear idea of having to get out of work whatever you can get out of it, not just success um, measured by financial uh, uh, metrics, but also by how you feel about what you're doing and how you feel that you are contributing to what happens there. And all of these people uh, can give, uh, I mean, gave us a lot of um, information that uh, matched also the uh, interviews that I did with scientists and artists and with sports people. Underneath all of that, there is this all um, understanding that you want to continue to develop your skills and continue to, to get to the highest challenge uh, that you could achieve. And um, the um, uh, relationship, of course, between having people in flow and having the work process in flow, the uh, whole, is uh, very obvious and you want to, uh, these are some obvious ways in which you can facilitate um, uh, and uh, again here uh, the uh, previous, uh, uh, you know, knowledge that that the um, uh, Lean Kanban has developed is, is related uh, to these ideas. And I uh, w was, uh, after we, I published, published a book, Good Business, based on the interviews with these uh, successful uh, business people, I get a lot of questions about how to, um, how to apply this at work. And um, it turns out that the best applications I had nothing to do with because the people themselves discard, uh, read the book, thought about it, and then they applied it. But um, a lot of people just n didn't know how to extrapolate how to build on these research findings and apply them. So um, that's when I de decided to uh, respond to one of these, um, um, uh, an invitation from a colleague in Hungary uh, who um, was here and who has uh, been doing very interesting work in developing game games that would get people to learn how to build business teams or how to uh, manage certain business problems. And we decided how um, can we gamify 
uh, 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 flow related um, learning. And it turned out that yes, um, it's possible. And we had these, um, we, that is, uh, the people in Hungary who developed this um, learned from the business literature what are the major skills that people have discovered. And these are about 29 different skills. And the ones in the blue, in the light blue, uh, uh, no, light, light green, there are four of these hexagons are number four, number 15, 24, 27. These are really the flow-based uh, skills. Um, and um, it, um, it uh, this was incorporated in the game. And uh, here, this just shows um, a kind of um, how you can use the game to measure uh, the different types of skills. These are two different uh, organizations. One is an automotive company, which is the blue line, and the other one is a financial service company, both of them from Europe. And um, you see how they differ in the various... Uh, skill level that their, wor their uh, workers have. Both are very high on uh, analytic skills and intuitive thinking. But um, for instance, the automotive company is much uh, better at delegating uh, work, whereas the financial service company is, uh, seems to be better at time pressure decisions. Now, all of these profiles were, were taken from how they played the game. You play the game, and uh, as you make the decisions, you uh, you show how they, uh, what, what skills they, they are most uh, attuned to doing. These are two companies that have been used um, have been using flow, and uh, uh, the green cargo uh, is a Swedish company that uh, uh, brings iron ore from the north of Sweden to the south, where uh, near uh, Göteborg, where they have the big. Um, uh, 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 the um, what, uh, I forget now what is the process by which I don't know is turned into steel essentially, and um, that that company uh, was famous for being in the red for 125 years in in a row. It's 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 um, and it was subsidized by the. Uh, uh, government, because it was very important to have access to these uh, minerals that that run the, the uh, essentially the economy of Sweden to a large extent, and so they green cargo survived only because of infusion of tax money into into it, and there one of the young. A young man from Sweden who studied with me decided to apply flow to the management of green cargo. Uh, the, no, he he didn't have green cargo in mind. He just wanted to use it in Sweden somehow, and he ended up working for green cargo. Became the HR person in green cargo, and um, it it took him three years to help the company make the first profit. And that, and it's been profitable since. And that was because he was able to convince the CEO of the company to introduce flow-based management. 
Uh, another example was uh, LG, where um, uh, the um, company that makes the screens for your um, most of our uh, computers and so forth. And LG, um, uh, the, the CEO of LG asked me to go there in, in Seoul, in Korea, to um, talk to the managers there. And I kept responding, saying, no, I'm too busy. I'm, it takes too long, et cetera, et cetera. Go and come just for, for uh, uh, talking to uh, a bunch of uh, engineers and then one day I got a call from uh, LAX the airport saying that the person called said I, I am uh, the general manager of LG in Seoul and my boss asked me to come and talk to you if possible and I I said well sure come on but I, I don't think I want to go he said, well, you know, he's very eager. He said, he read the Bible five times, but he read flow six times. So I said, all right, <laughs> come on and let's talk. And then um, I went there and, and uh, it was a, actually very nice. There were like 700 managers because I think LG has quarter million employees all over the world and 700 of the top managers. And then um, the CEO showed me the uh, 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 profile of income and expenditure and profits for the company, and it showed that the um, income has been going uh, the, uh, straight up for 25 years, but the... Um, Profits went up at the beginning, then, uh, and then they went down. And then 10 years ago, there was another inflection point, and it went up like this. And he showed that inflection point of 10 years before and said, since that point, we made $6.5 billion more than predicted. So uh, that was uh, the... And what they did was something similar to the Swedes with the green cargo, but it was act, um, not as um, uh, uh, personally. Uh, in green cargo, they really had a method of building a kind of a pyramid of responsibilities so that each each um, person who had subordinates had to find out what the subordinates enjoyed from their work and what made them bored, what made them anxious. And they used some of our methods to establish that. And then what they, once they found out what the person's uh, comfort zone was or where they what they needed, they needed more challenge or they needed more uh, skills. Then the, the boss had to def decide how to increase or decrease uh, the um, challenger skills of the people uh, who work for them. So each person had to be responsible between three and five of the subordinates. And they got kind of monthly feedback from the workers. And at first, the, the uh, managers of the company said, oh, this is just another level of uh, uh, demands on our time, and it's, it's going to be a wasted effort and so forth. But after two years, they, uh, the management was sold on the idea because they saw what was happening, that the people they work, uh, the turnover went down, the uh, personnel, the people were uh, more excited about their work, they volunteered, etc. So this, this is one where um, um, this 
is a Hungarian a major uh, saving bank. The, but this was, I was called there to talk to the owner, of, uh, the, to the top man in this bank, who um, is also, and to advise about, about the, the bank, but it turned out that the CEO of the bank was also the uh, president of the Hungarian Soccer Association. And um, he uh, complained uh, about the fact that Hungarian soccer, which was such a great uh, power in soccer uh, 50 years ago, um, soccer ha is not, uh, was not in the top uh, uh, teams to qualify for the World Cup in the past two uh, section, sessions of the World Cup. And I happened to have a, a student at, at the university who studied basketball games in um, America and found that there is a, a procedure by which the coaches, when the two teams are more or less equal um, 10 minutes before the end of the game. Um, then they call the team together a, a timeout and they, they, they adopt a process by which each, uh, the team member, uh, all, all of the uh, guys in the team are told, don't try to shoot the ball yourself, pass it to the ace, to the one person who is really good. Um, and so in the Lakers, it was uh, Kobe Bryant. He, he had to take the burden of the game at the end if the, end, uh, the game was more or less tied. Now, what my student showed, and this was very obvious once you saw the numbers, is that the productivity of Kobe Bryant went down in the last five minutes or 10 minutes when this procedure was adopted. And also the other team members were doing, they couldn't actually shoot because they just had to pass it to Bryant. So um, I told this story to the president of the soccer association and he said, oh, but that, this is the problem with our coach, our coach, when the, the uh, game is in balance, he will ta tell people to just, the, the team, pass it to the, the best scorer and don't try to do your own thing otherwise. Okay, so he was very excited to hear about this and I, I forgot about it and then about three months later he sends me an uh, email saying, <clears throat> guess what, the, I told the, uh, your story to my coach, to the coach of the national team, and for the first time in 53 years, the first time we qualified for the World Cup. And this was a kind of... Uh, unexpected contribution um, because I was there to talk to him about the operations of the bank, but the, the uh, understanding of the importance of flow is not just uh, in the business area or in the sports area. It, this is a human need that we have to do our best, to try to do it, and uh, to um, find ways in which um, uh, we can uh, demonstrate that we can uh, uh, um, achieve the goals that we set. And uh, this is the most important uh, human achievement is to be able to be effective in the goals that we send. And therefore, 
Uh, one of the takeaways of uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, that if you want a unit of, to perform well, you can try to increase the, not only the flow of the process of the production, but also the flow of the experience of the worker on, on the web. So that's um, uh, the major takeaway. And since time has been running out, I think for a while, I'm sorry. To, uh, okay. <laughs>